What's up, y'all? Welcome to Conversation Peace with Patrick Armstrong. I am the titular Patrick, and this is a show where we talk about the missing pieces of the conversations we're already having. Shout out to our returning listeners and a high five and hello to everybody joining us for the very first time. I appreciate you as we embark on this new journey of 2024. My guests today are Asian American filmmakers whose new short film music video, No Clouds in My Summer, a surreal romantic drama that non-linearly explores a young man's introspection after a breakup is set to release this spring. It is an honor and privilege to welcome Jason Poon and Jeff Wu to the show. Hey y'all, thanks for joining me. Thank, thank you, you bro. Thank that you. that was a crazy intro. That was <laughs> that was Sean Evans' <laughs> I'm quality. I'm impressed. Hey, that is a huge compliment to me. I love Sean Evans, <laughs> and it's like an aspiration, an aspirational thing to be as good as he is. So I appreciate that. Yes, sir. I'd How say y'all you doing? Have an excellent voice. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate that as well. Thank you. Um, that's why I stick to the podcasting side of things, not necessarily getting on camera too much, even though this <laughs> will go out on YouTube and people do see my face. Uh, it's the voice that people generally show up for, I feel like. Mm, mm. <laughs> so how y'all fellas doing? Doing good. Doing really, really good. <laughs> yeah. We just got back from the holidays, so I'm feeling rested. That's yeah, good. Same, same, same. I feel like um, I uh, started making my goals, and I haven't told Jason this, but my goal this year is to uh, learn more Chinese. So I just had like, my first tutoring session today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was very interesting, very interesting. How are you feeling about after this first Chinese lesson set up? Are you ready to take it on for the rest of 2024? Uh, <laughs> you know what was interesting about this session was um, I used to have younger tutors who were closer to my age. And this time I, uh, this tutor, she was a little bit older and she kind of cooked me in my tutoring session. She was like, are you ready to make the commitment? It doesn't sound like you're ready. <laughs> you need to be oh, more damn. serious about this. So I was like, oh, shoot. I had, it made me reconsider for a second, but... I feel good. I was like, felt like an auntie roasting me. Because you are fluent, but I guess you want to get even better, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So it's like a brush up. So that's, is that why you think she might've felt like you weren't ready to be like, you didn't feel as committed as she wanted you to feel? <laughs> um, I think I told her, I was like, I'm more interested in just kind of conversation. Like I need to brush up on deeper I, I was trying to tell her, I was like, I don't know how to emotionally communicate with my parents in Chinese. These type of words I don't okay. know. So, um, but I was like, I don't want to practice reading and writing. I just kind of want to talk. <laughs> and she was like, oh, I need you to get like an AP workbook. I need you to practice. Like, doesn't sound like you're really serious about it, you know? Oh, damn. This is like an intensive lesson that she's got lined up for you. I, that's yeah. Good. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad <laughs> thing. Like, I'm trying to decide today, like, whether or not she was like, you need to let me know. You email me if you're ready, you know? Damn, taking it serious. <laughs> I mean, it's not like you were trying to go back to school. It's just like, I'm trying to learn a little bit more and get, like you said, emotionally connect in this conversation. Exactly. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I appreciate y'all for joining me. Um, for folks out there listening, Jason and Jeff actually reached out to me after our episode with Jason Chu dropped, and it took me a minute to get my house in order and get back to them, but luckily they were still interested in coming on the show. So I'm really excited to talk to you not only about the the career and the journeys that y'all have been on as Asian American filmmakers, but also about this next project you got coming out. But before we get to that, for folks listening who may not know who y'all both are, do you mind sharing just a little bit more about yourselves? Me first? Yeah. Um, let's see. I, I think I got into filmmaking when I was really young. I think that's like pretty interesting for my journey. I was 13. I was like a latchkey kid. I think that's the term. Basically, my parents were working all the time. I was at home. I was lucky enough to have my own computer. And I was on YouTube circa like 2008. And I started making like anime music videos. So I would kind of combine like Tupac songs and Naruto. And mm. that's kind of how I started. Um, it's funny enough because I started making music videos. And now roughly 15 years later, I'm making music videos for like my full-time job. So I quit my full-time job two years ago to start Popeye, Popeye Media, which is my production company. And I'm skipping over a lot of steps. But basically, I went to <laughs> film school. And now I'm a full-time music video director and kind of living my dream in many ways. I love it. I love it. What about you, Jason? So I, uh, for the, for a lot of maybe the older Asian viewers or Asian American viewers that were into the media world, I came up basically same generation as like Wong Fu. Okay. And so kind of like seeing them as a peer in terms of age, 
but also watching their journey as it kind of grew and being in film school around the same time and kind of following their path. And then uh, working really heavily into like the, that height of Asian American pop culture YouTube stuff that was happening in like the early 2010s. Mm. So being very much part of that, working on set, directing music videos for a lot of the different artists um, and uh, dabbling in my own writing and directing, worked on a couple of shorts, working on a lot of videography. So just have a hand in a lot of different things um, for quite a while. But most recently, kind of like last three years, I've been delving into a new creative passion, which is fashion design. So that's kind of been the main focus now. But I think the love for video is still it's still in there. It's just maybe not the priority at all times. But that's kind of how we kind of came together to do this collaboration. Yeah, sure. Was through the film or through your new venture into fashion design. <laughs> and then you're like, OK, I'm still like operating here. Yeah, I mean, pretty much it. Uh, the project came to me and I at that point, I was kind of not really thinking about filmmaking, but I, you know, I've been friends with Jeff for like 10 years. And so I was like, man, this guy's killing it in the music video world. I would love to have a second pair of eyes to work in this project. So that's how we end up co-directing. I was like, hey, we want to come along and yeah. do this. And he was on board. And so that's how the collaboration happened. And in a way, kind of like drew me back into filmmaking. So we even didn't talk about more stuff and other projects. So it's been cool. I love it. I love it. I like that you both have operated in the same but kind of separate areas of this industry of filmmaking and that you've been doing it while we or or as part of this rise in Asian American filmmakers and especially within like the last five eight years where we've seen a lot of visibility or more visibility maybe not a lot but more visibility for Asian American mm -hmm. filmmakers um, and not just filmmakers mm -hmm. but at all levels directing writing producing talent um, what has your perspective been from your respective areas of work as you've been a part of this growth in this community, what does that look like from your perspective, that journey, not only as individuals, mm -hmm. but as a community um, of Asian, of the AA and HPI community? I would say that when you said like a, a lot of changes, I would say that the changes that I've seen, I could have never imagined even maybe six, seven years ago. Okay. Like pre crazy transitions, like that era, I could have never met. I remember talking to friends, it's like, maybe this will happen in 10, 20 years. But, uh, and I think that at, as it's come, we see how it's very complex and there's more things we want from it. But I would say that I couldn't have imagined it, you know, when I started my journey. Mm. Yeah, it's so interesting. I was just watching a quiz lady and then I watched, um, what was Randall Park's uh, movie that just came out? Shortcomings, I believe. Oh, yeah. Um, yep. I watched both of them back to back for whatever reason that night. And uh, I think the most surprising thing was I wasn't surprised. Mm. It was, it felt commonplace. I was like, I just turn on Hulu. It's already there. You know, I go, right. go on YouTube TV and I rent shortcomings. It's just kind of, it's almost there. There's always room for more. There's quite a lot of room for more Asian American cinema, but it's surprising how I don't even, I'm not even surprised that there is an Asian American movie out this year. Sure. I just think of it as a movie and I start watching it. Um, obviously, compared to Crazy Rich Asians, I don't know how many years ago that was, but it there's so much now. It, yeah. 20, um, yeah. <laughs> something around there. Um, real yeah, quick yeah. before we go, can you, uh, Jeff, can you back your mic a little bit? You're kind of just bumping it, and that's where that sound is coming from. I see. Still I, see sound I got good. you. No, you're good. You're good. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Um, Okay, what was I going to say? What was I going to say? Oh, yeah, I know what I was going to say. Um, so it's interesting that it's like now when you go to Hulu or any streaming site, you see like AAPI, like movies or films or black movies and films and creators. Or now we all are starting to get our own little sections of these places. And, you know, you mentioned Crazy Rich Asians as being kind of this boon for like this launching pad. And even, and before that happened, Jason, you talked about, I couldn't even imagine what that was like when that film came out, what was your initial reaction? And were you expecting where we are now to come about because of crazy rich Asians? Hmm. It was, I remember feeling really excited. It, it kind of almost felt like a little bit of a fever dream because I think there were so many up and coming, like specifically like Ronnie Chang, Jimmy O Yang, like those guys who they had been in the scene for a while. They were like the the C character of the of the TV show, or whatever, or on you know Comedy Central, and then seeing them in a movie and uh, 
it felt it felt kind of surreal and then like the hype around it and i remember the first time i saw it was actually new orleans and i was mm. just so sensitive to the audience i was i was working out there and uh the movie had just come out so i was like i gotta go see it so i went to go see it and i was kind of looking around and i would say you know majority not asian maybe 10 percent asian maybe less and people were just like really into it and really emotionally invested in thinking that this reality wasn't even possible and then seeing the reaction was so, uh, it felt really special. Uh, mm. And so I think from that moment, I, I definitely feel like uh, the, the momentum kept on going and, and I hope that continues to like evolve and grow too. Mm. I love it. What about you, Jeff? What was your perspective like once that came out, especially your background in music videos and being in that particular side of the industry? What did you feel? What was your reaction really to Crazy Rich Asians? Is like, is this a boon for me and what I'm doing, or am I still working to get where we want to go? Oh yeah, interesting. So that's a really good question. Um, I think I definitely would approach it more from a fan perspective because I think there were people that we knew from the YouTube era that ended mm. up being in the movie. Like me and Jason Poon actually met through working with the Fun Brothers. I don't know if they they were they were like a Extra, they were in there. They were, they were in there, right? Yeah. So I think just knowing people who were in the movie on top of like Kina Granis, obviously I was a big fan of any Asian American creator on YouTube growing up. Um, I was kind of geeked, just kind of like pointing out people that I knew. And just knowing that they were kind of around this LA area was definitely reaffirming as a fan. And then maybe future tense thinking about it, thinking that it could be possible for us as well. Like it's not... It's not a fever dream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are examples, you know. It's Somebody. almost like if 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 this could happen, I didn't think this would happen. At least for me, if this that thing that I didn't think could happen, what else could happen? And I think that's that was kind of the excitement in the moment. Yeah. Somebody ran a seven minute mile, if someone could do a little <laughs> faster, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah exactly, 100%. Exactly. Yeah. It's interesting too to draw a line from something like Crazy Rich Asians to everything everywhere all at once, which Crazy Rich Asians seems to be a little bit more formulaic in the sense of like a blockbuster movie that's based in reality to where we now have everything everywhere all at once, which is so far it's very rooted in family and, 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 and those core values, but is so far outside of the creative spectrum of anything. I feel like we've seen in live action, let alone like you have stuff in anime and you have stuff in, in different animated forms, I think that can reach and broach those things. But everything ever there, everywhere, all at once brings it all home in a way that's just so interesting to me because that movie came out and was really seminal for me as an adoptee who rejected being mm. Asian for a long time, who didn't watch the Fung Bros, who really wasn't even into Crazy Rich Asians when it came out and didn't understand the importance of it. And then now over three years, finding myself really connecting to this type of movie because of the community aspect and let alone mm. just being like a multiverse story, something that I've always been kind of interested in. Um, and it like spurs this newer conversation, not only of like what's possible, but where do we go next? And I think that's what we've been hearing a lot. You know, like you said, crazy rich Asians is what, what can we do? And now everything everywhere all at once is taking that a step further. It's like, what are we going to do? Um, like that. while that's mm. been, I think the dominant part of the conversation, there are aspects still within Asian American filmmaking that I think we're not talking about. And I think y'all might have some specific insights into. So I was wondering what you mm -hmm. both think about from your perspectives is missing from the conversation that we need to be talking about right now, even though we're seeing successes like in everything everywhere all at once, like a, for all intents and purposes, this new live action version of Avatar with an all Asian cast and mm. you know, there's stuff swirling around about the creators and all the original creators and all that. But what do you think? What do we need to be talking about at the moment? Like within the community, outside of the community that deals in all this? Yeah, I would love to answer this because uh, I think this is something I complain about to Jason quite a lot. Um, I think maybe it's a more micro thought than a macro thought on Asian American cinema. And perhaps it's more of a viewpoint on like media overall. Um, Taking it back a bit, like I was in early mid high school, kind of when Asian American YouTube became a thing, became mm. like AJ Raphael, Tim Tim Lee Day, like you know they were like touring all over the world, off of being pop popping on YouTube, um, and watching Wang Fu do what they did. And I think as I grew up and I kind of joined as a PA, 
I was like, uh, I joined as a PA on one of Jason Poon's shoots and see, beginning to be a part of the world. As I grew up and became more of a filmmaker, I think what was missing was some type of, what am I, what's the word I'm looking for? Like passing the torch. I think mm, I wish there was more okay. infrastructure built around curating and building Asian American not just filmmakers, but content creators. But again, I think content creators wasn't really even a word when I joined college, which sure. was around 2013, 2014. So I felt like Jason Poon was one of those. Jason Poon is and continues to be my mentor. <laughs> you know, gives me great life advice, gives me great career advice. Outside of Jason Poon, I felt like it was a hard, I had a hard time finding the right people to support my career, to give me the right advice. What's the next step? Obviously, filmmaking and creative work is so it's kind of like uh it's not clear what you're supposed to do next it's not very sure. linear um i had a lot of questions that jason poon helped me answer but even then i feel like jason poon had like there were gaps in your knowledge as well that i like wanted to patch up with people that i could talk to that i could rely on and i had a hard time finding that maybe other people have found that than i haven't but that's something that i feel like we were, we would always talk about yeah just to add on to that i think it was something that I wasn't really thinking about too much because when we were coming up, everything was so new. Like when I went to film school, they were still shooting with film and digital mm -hmm. was just kind of at the edge. And, and so like a lot of people who were shooting the DSLRs, that was like the first generation when I was in mm -hmm. college and that change was so significant and it made things look cinematic. Uh, but as I was coming up, we kind of were just in the in the dark doing things. And I think we were lucky in that there was a lot of, a lot of people wanting to do projects. So we were always active doing projects, but the transition from doing this to like doing movies, there's this huge gap. And I, so, something that I was thinking about was like, people say this often, it's like, trust the process. And like mm. this idea of like, there's a process and things are gonna be difficult and so forth. But what if you've never gone through the process? How do you trust the process that you've never gone through? How sure. do you know where I am within the process? And so when mm. he reached out to me, <laughs> you know, like he's, I mean, he's super smart, very talented, like tons of skills end up going to you know nyu film school so he would have been fine either way but i feel like <laughs> seeing the the community as whole like who am i looking to to have conversation about how to get into quote unquote hollywood how do i right. get a job directing tv and there was especially within the asian american world there's like if they're they're there i don't know who they are i've never seen them they're behind the scenes and the people that are doing it, they're kind of in a different lane, you know, which is what we used to call like new media. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And that was kind of okay. almost like a, a ghetto, a, a Asian yes. ghetto, like where we kind of yeah, exist yeah, yeah. within. And so kind of figuring it out that I think it was very challenging. And I think it's something we still think about a lot, but seeing it like with the Daniels or whoever, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, not that I have access to them, but that in itself, seeing them at the Academy Awards is kind of crazy. Yeah, a hundred percent. I appreciate you sharing that because I think it's a really interesting thing to think about. I think about that a lot just from a general community aspect when it comes to working with organizations or trying to start to do something. I love what you said, like, how can you trust the process if you've never gone through the process before? Like, if this is your first time doing something, how do you find an investor or somebody to like mentor you even? And I think it's interesting you name that, like you call it, Jeff called a lack of infrastructure. Do you think it's more of a accessibility issue or is it a visibility issue or is it potentially both? Yeah. So interesting. I haven't thought to that minutia of whether it's visibility or what was the accessibility you said? Yeah. Like the accessibility in the sense that like you, like you said, you know, the Daniels are there. Do you have access to those people? Maybe not necessarily. Does infrastructure give you something like that? Is it a la Is it that lack of accessibility to a said quote unquote infrastructure? Or is it the visibility, like you said, of folks who make these opportunities possible, but you just don't know who those people are? Is it mm. either one of those? Is it one singular one? Is it both? I think I might say accessibility because I think there are Asian American content creators that I did reach out to that I was fans of. And then again, this is the context of me reaching out like with a really informal email at the age of 18, <laughs> like sure. probably super unprofessional, like, but I was <laughs> reaching out and like telling people that I was like, I was interested in their work, that I wanted to work with them. I realized much later that I'm probably the age I I'm right now I'm 28. I'm probably the age that, the Fun Brothers were when I first started working with them. Like I probably mm. realized that they're like also trying to figure stuff out. That's sure. something 
I realized when I got older is like they also, not Fun Brothers specifically, but content creators in general who are starting their own business, they are also trying to figure out what to do. And obviously taking on mentorship and taking on mentees is an extra weight for somebody who is just beginning. Sure. In many ways. Yeah. So accessibility perhaps, and maybe also like capacity of people. Well, like you said, when somebody's just starting, it can be really difficult. And then when you reach a certain level of popularity, like when people, when you become visible, like you have people maybe reaching out, I've done the cold email, the cold call, (laughs) very (laughs) informal, most likely the reason why people don't respond to me, but you know, I'm not scared to do it. Um, But I get what you're saying about when you talked about the passing of the torch being kind of one of those things that we don't talk about. How do we address that now? Like, because I think that's a that's in itself accessibility. You know, I think that's just a Mm -hmm. metaphor for how do we reach each other and how do we build kind of this the infrastructure, the cross maybe not not even community but creator collaboration. How do we work that into where we are now? Because we're in such a different place than five, six, seven years ago where people do have platforms, where people have made it to a certain level, where people are every day now kind of breaking into new ground. How do we get to this point and address this lack of passing that torch? Man, that is the question. I I, I think my thought is... Please solve this. Please solve (laughs) this. this, Please. I don't want to be too critical because I feel like there is good in a lot of stuff that's going on. Yes. But I think that uh, a lot of the events that I've gone to uh, feel so much more about the show of the event versus maybe a content first, skill first, uh, storytelling first kind of thing. Uh, especially within the Asian American world, I think there is like maybe a clout or like a prestige that, oh, within this community, I'm kind of a star. And that kind of platform, that space becomes a place for that. Uh, one joke I always tell is I remember I was at a film festival and film festivals are interesting where you get really creative, talented uh, artists, but you also have a lot of people who are like, oh yeah, I got this show. I got that show. I'm going to have a meeting with uh, Sony next week. You know, that thing. And I remember sitting at an event two years back to back in the same, like it was like an after party. And I remember the same person hearing, like overhearing the exact same story one year apart of this guy kind of like doing his whole spiel. I don't even know who this person is, but I just recognized him and then I heard this the same thing. And there's so much of that, which is mm. not really real. It's like this need to like kind of puff our chest, validate ourselves versus actually developing and talking about the nuts and bolts of actual skills and mm. things that aren't sexy, things that right. uh, are very complex and complicated that doesn't sound good on some sort of like pitch deck, but like getting into the nuts and bolts of how we actually grow something uh and i don't think there's a lot of that there is a lot of like networking and kind of like sure. public facing mm. like fun stuff which i think is necessary but um stuff where we actually develop i think is much more rare sure i appreciate you naming that like i feel mm. i felt the same at some events that i've been to over the past two years where it's like it does feel very f- showy and I don't necessarily want to call them performative because I do think that there there's a place for them and it's necessary yep, for, for us sure. to gather and celebrate 100%. Yep. But I do think there is this idea of that permeates throughout that I've noticed and maybe and I might have the wrong perspective on it, but where scarcity is really like driving that chest puffing where it's like I've made it and I'm like establishing myself, but I can't pass the torch because then it takes away from maybe my opportunity and in some way. And so I think it's, that's something that not only have Asian Americans had to address, but all marginalized communities, we're all kind of fighting each other. And I feel like in the film industry in particular, it can be really difficult to navigate that kind of, that water a little bit. Mm. Yeah, I think it's difficult enough just to, for anybody to break into the film industry. So obviously we're being critical and trying to figure out ways to open the opportunities, but I also recognize that it's hard for everybody, no matter who you are. Sure. A hundred percent. I have a, I do have a thought on this, which is uh, maybe more logistical, and this is just a guess. Um, and I'm going to try to navigate this because um, it's, I guess, it's not really that sensitive. My thought on this is, <laughs> I think the answer might be some form of investment, whatever that is. I think about, um, I told Jason this before. I think a lot about Wang Fu's uh, YouTube channel ISA TV. Oh yeah, so fucking cool, like. They are featuring music music artists that I 
Doug Danike Dan's documentary. Yep. Um, it was to me, it was pre ADA Rising before ADA Rising was a thing. And it had it was this great platform. They had the game show. It was really exciting times. And I think about that in terms in the context of ADA Rising, which I was an intern at very early on, and seeing kind of the way that that they moved differently, obviously because they had investors. It was more of in this venture world. I think about that also in context of myself and my own small business, which is sometimes I'm afraid of investment. I'm afraid of taking that next step. I'm afraid of assuming that responsibility. I'm afraid of collectivizing. Um, and I wonder if other organizations feel the same way that I do, that they're afraid to grow in that ex- exponential way that AD sure. Rising did. And I don't know what X Factor outside of investment, but that's my thought on it. I appreciate you sharing that. And I have a follow-up question to that. Do you think that, I think it's totally valid and natural to feel that because one of the reasons I started this show was so I had full creative control over something of my own. But I had not ever had that before. The other shows and things that I've been involved with, I was either just a partner of or uh, was just like a, a worker essentially. And I was like, okay, I'm going to start something. I just want something that is my own thing. Mm -hmm. And that's like what Popeye is for you is like, this is your creative baby and giving like taking on investors requires then more cooks in the kitchen or at least eyes on the product and whatever the work that's being done. Is it, is it like, is it a, a little bit of that of giving away some of that control to, in order to start to chase that growth a little bit? It may be, it may not be. I, I, and I don't want to put you on the spot yeah. from a <laughs> no, 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 standpoint. No. But I think it's no, just interesting it. to think about. Uh, so I've, I've had Popeye since 2017. So it's been quite a long time. A, a big portion of it at the start was, it was almost the reverse. It began as a passion project. And then it became something that I tried to turn into a business. Okay. Um, so in some ways, I'm okay giving up my baby and having investors and having outside voices and having uh, advisors in that sense. I think what I'm afraid of is I don't know of anybody else who's even received investment for their production company. I don't mm. know anybody else who owns a production company, you know, sure. or at least I'm not like <laughs> close friends. I'm not even close friends with anybody who does something similar that I do. Um, that kind of gray area on top of, uh, my own, definitely my own creative selfish desires makes for like, I don't know, you know, <laughs> I, yeah. I feel like it would have to be a right situation, right person. But in that case, most likely I'm probably not going to receive investment anytime in the near future, you know? Right. Well, again, that's like this lack of infrastructure one. Um, I think it's both visibility and accessibility because if we don't know, of anyone receiving investment, like how are we supposed to go out and find it? And that makes it just naturally inaccessible because we don't know where to go to access it in the first place. And I think that's a genuine fear because it's like, we want to maybe grow. We want to maybe do these things, but time works against us in the way of like, well, if we take longer to find the right person to partner with, you know, somebody else might get it again, going back to scarcity or whatever it is, like, Mm -hmm. we're all kind of competing in the same space a little bit. And so yeah, I I appreciate you sharing. I think it's just a really interesting part of that conversation that I haven't heard anyone talk about in this particular space, (laughs) where it's like, that's or at least voice the fear to in a in in that way of like, Mm -hmm. I'm afraid of it, because I don't know where it's where it can come from. And I don't know where to go. So I appreciate you sharing. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you for asking. I, it's good to confront the fear. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we're here to do. And mm-hmm. I appreciate, you know, I think there's a lot of different potential avenues for it. And I think right now, as you're able to continue to do work without even other advisors or any other eyes or anything, you can kind of chase your own projects and stuff, which leads me into No Clouds in My Summer, which you have coming out. And you said in your initial email that this project has come out come about over the last like two years. Um, so one of the things I want to ask you about, well, first, let me ask you about it. Let me just ask you, can you talk a little mm-hmm. bit about, share a little bit of, of a synopsis of what this is and then kind of how it came to be? Yeah, so uh, I had a uh, 
friend who reached out to me and, and it, it was a mutual friend with the artist and uh, she works as an AD, uh, shout out to Mishi uh, in the industry. And she said, hey, I got a buddy who's um, basically debuting a project and wants to do a music video and she thought it would be a good fit. And this was like during the pandemic. So we, we had the conversation and I didn't think too much about it. We followed up and through a course of a bunch of stuff over many, many months, um, I, I decided to kind of come bo- come on board and this was going to space where I was kind of deciding whether I want to jump back into it. Am I still feeling filmmaking right. or not? And once I kind of decide, okay, I want to do this, I reached out to Jeff to see if he'd be interested in co-directing and he was super interested, wanted to be on board. And uh, from there, we basically started working together to put this project together. You want to talk a little bit about it? Uh, yeah, I, I just remember getting the call and um, being like, hanging up and telling Kelsey, I was like, this would be the biggest project that I've ever worked on. Okay. Um, I, I almost can't believe it. You know? Um, sure. I was, I think I was like fresh, maybe three, four months into like full-time music videos. So hearing this from like Jason, I was like, I was really stoked. I was always like, I'm not even sure if this is going to happen. Like, <laughs> but I have to explore it. I have to do any, everything in my power. You know, I was like, I was already ideating ideas and, um, Basically, in like kind of nudging Jason, I'm like, oh, let's do it, bro. <laughs> you know, it'll, it'll be sick. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Describe the project. Yeah. Um, I yeah. gave the one line synopsis, but yeah, yeah, yeah. give us a little bit more detail. Uh, Junse, artist who has not released any music yet, unknown, anonymous, as, as he is like to kept for now, um, has a EP that he's been working on even longer than us. He's been look, working on it for five years. He says, Damn. I'm ready to drain my entire savings to go all in on a music video. And that was basically the pitch. He had an idea that was relationship oriented. He had like six to eight songs and he wanted to do a short film. Ideal client for a filmmaker. He says, full creative control. Do what you guys want to do. <laughs> you know, make it like relationship oriented, which is kind of like yeah. a lot of yeah, some like there's some breakup songs or some love songs. There's some like falling into love. Uh, some 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 simpy songs so there's like a, a nice mix of uh, of content in there but all relationship related yes okay so, so the short film is all is for the whole ep it's set to the whole thing am i reading that right sort of uh okay we, we um he worked with us and basically he did a remix of his own music <laughs> to kind of fit it so he almost treated the his album as a score for the music video slash short film i love that <laughs> yeah, so there's some dialogue scenes. We he's not even in it, so we just casted two actors, um, and a bunch of other like side side characters, or whatever, and and kind of built this whole story around them. And as they go through their kind of like journey of love, uh, the music is kind of the score to the that project. Yeah, that's amazing. How, what yeah. was it like collaborating with an artist who one has been working on a project for five years, but also is like, <laughs> I don't want to be visible in any way. You can have the music, and I'll actually tweak tweak uh, a tweak with the music a little bit to fit the film. But what is it like collaborating in that sense? He was a great collaborator. I mean, he the best. gave us basically a lot of control. I think he had there's things that he maybe didn't understand. We were kind of coming from a more nerdy film perspective, sure. and there's some stuff he didn't necessarily catch. But I think through the whole process, he really trusted us, and he really gave us control. And I think as we went through so many different versions of the edit, you know, like I think everything everywhere all at once was a huge mm-hmm. reference for, for us. Huge. We okay. love the non, the kind of like the almost like fantastical aspect of it. And like, yeah, kind of like these, these, uh, warps of the, of, of this, like of different space and dimension. So we kind of played with that idea within it as well. So there's like a little sci-fi kind of aspect to it. And he was really into it, but some of the ideas on paper didn't necessarily make sense. He kind of trusted <laughs> us through all of it and, and let us do our thing. Yeah. Nice. He allowed the story. He got the storyboards like, I don't understand. Just film it anyway. Here's my bank account and <laughs> go ahead and make this project. <laughs> yeah. I think the trippiest part was I remember sitting with him and I, I, there was always, um, uh, there's a lot of moments that were like this. I was sitting with him. I said, are you okay if this entirely flops? <laughs> are you okay if nobody sees this? Are you okay with like, what does success look like to you? You know, there's a chance that nobody sees this. This is just kind of how it goes, right? Um, and just double checking before he even said any money. I was like, are, like almost as your friend now. Like, are you cool with that? Right. And and he was, he was he's actually so inspiring. He said, yes, I don't care. This is for the art. I've always wanted to make something like this. Let's do it. 
full send it. And then, and then he sent the money and I was like, I, I, it was so inspiring <laughs> as a creative yeah. because another thing we talk about is risk and risk tolerance as creatives, as Asian American creatives. And I feel like we have lower risk tolerance, at Definitely. least for us. Definitely. And seeing a younger Asian American creator just go, let's do it. What do I got to lose? And I was like, you're right. Fuck what do it. you have to lose? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. What do we have to lose? Nothing. Like all, all we can do is give our best effort and have fun while doing it. So I think we did that with this project. Yeah, I think the, the big part that you, you remind me of is that this was a passion project for him. And we could have easily just treated it as a job and just like did sure. some haphazard kind of thing just to get it done. It might have looked cool, but really no heart. And I think the reason it took so long was because we did a lot of reshoots. We kind of brought the actors back in. They kind of like donated their time to to do some voiceovers on top of things and just kind of make the story work. And I feel like there was a responsibility we had where it's like, man, this guy's really trusting us. And so we don't want to just do a project that is going to get the project done, but we want to do a project that we all collectively love, you know, not just for us, but for the actors, for the the artist, you know, for us as directors, for the yeah. producer, for Kelsey, you know, so all of us. Right. Well, it's not like it becomes everyone's passion project. And especially for you, you know, you had started to go down or at least think about going down this other path that leads kind of maybe a little bit away from filmmaking and for him to, for them to reach out to you and for you to feel like, okay, there's something here that pulls me back in. I thought I was out and they pulled me back in with this, you know, that speaks to, the love I think you have for the project. How did, and it seems like, you know, this was pretty quickly something that you realized, okay, I want to pour, you know, I want both of us to pour our hearts and souls into this. How did that process evolve over these two years? Like, was it always like, we're going full bore a hundred percent on what we want to do? Or was it, was it a working up to getting to that point? where, okay, he's finally sent the money and we're going into it. And we're not going to just treat it like another thing, another paycheck. But this is like, in some ways, just as much our thing as it is his, as it is everyone else's that's involved. Uh, I feel like one of the main benefits of co-directing is that you have someone to help you kind of push the ship when you're maybe like, maybe not emotionally <laughs> motivated or whatever. Sure. Or maybe you're, you're just tired. And I think that like, Jeff and Kelsey, who end up not only um, directing, but like they end up taking on the producing role as well. There was uh, other producers who were involved originally, and they kind of like, hey, I don't think we can take on the project right now. So they stepped in as producers. And I feel like, to their credit, I feel like they really drove the ship. And so for me, there was moments when I'm kind of stuck on an idea or maybe overly fixated on something. And I think it was nice for me to kind of experience a different directing process mm -hmm. through them. And that was really, I think, helpful for me. Um, but so I think that that made the process... Uh, in the moments that was difficult for me to, to kind of the ship kept going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. I also feel like the process definitely to your question, we definitely built up over the process of two years. Um, going back to like when I first heard about it, we were both very different directors than we are now at the end of uh, the process. Two years, we both work on our individual projects. And I think this is, we, we had said that this project is probably the best reflection of our skill point at this time. Just because mm. we learned so many different things throughout the process, building out the portfolio, uh, the building out the backgrounds for the characters, trying color grading for the first time, adding sound design, doing additional shoots. We even like put up the different scenes like on a Figma board and kind of like rearrange things. There are so many different new things that we attempted for this project that makes this the best thing that we've both ever made. And I think that's special because Typically, historically, filmmaking takes so long that so many I, I filmmakers I hear them say it's like once project's done, it doesn't even reflect my skill now. And sure. so I feel like I, I don't even appreciate the project because it's like not what I can do. And they're so critical of whatever it is. And I feel like for this project, after it came out, I'm like, no, this is definitely the best project I've ever worked on. I'm very proud of it. I feel like it reflects the skill I have right now. I do feel like I've, I've grown since then, but it's something I'm really proud of. Yeah. I love that. Um, you talked about a bunch of new things that you're able to try as filmmakers over this time. What's one way that you feel like you've really grown? You Like you said, you've grown even more since then, and this is the best project you've done. How did you grow in, in one specific way as filmmakers through this process, whether it be the color grading or, or even something as specific as that? Uh, I feel like one big thing with working with them is my taste improved. Uh, <laughs> okay. I think I, 
I, and I think it's kind of underrated, but there's something about it where uh, it allowed me to kind of take more risk. Uh, and I think creative risk. And I think I used to be more conventional in terms of my process and the way I execute, but we, we have a, we have like a little tradition where every time we meet up, we'll watch like a short film, some sort of Asian American short film, just kind of talk about it or music video. I think just that process of watching other people's work, hearing their Mm. perspective and like, especially Kelsey, I think she has this thing where she loves to lean into like weird, weird (laughs) stuff. Sure. Uh, Whatever weird means. It could be like a sound, uh, a weird sound design choice or camera angle and kind of like leaning into that. I was like, oh, I see. I'm starting to develop why this is cool. And maybe I couldn't even articulate before. Like I felt it, but now seeing them talk about it in a very concrete way in the like nuts and bolts of the edit. I was like, ah, this, this makes sense. And I, I, my taste really improved, I think, through the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, the meetings were like 50% work and then 50% talking. <laughs> like, nice. Kind of. Sounds like a good therapy. meeting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've almost forgot the question. What was what, the how have you grown? How have what, I grown? Oh. Yep. What, what, are, what area that you maybe improved in? Um, oh, man, so much. Let me pick, let me pick one. I just gave my brain real quick. I think... Uh, one of the things that we also did differently for this project and why it took so long is we did many community screenings. <laughs> it was oh, like okay. a Hollywood studio where we brought in different people along different versions to just rip it apart. Like we are on version 27 of the edit currently. Damn. Okay. And so there was 27, oh, maybe not 27, but there was like at least 15 different times where we invited people to be like, does this make sense? Do you like this character? What do you feel about this character? Where did it lag in the in the edit? Um, what makes sense? Is it okay that it that it doesn't make sense? Um, another big question that we confronted was: Is it music video? Or is it narrative? Do we push more towards music video? Do we push more towards narrative? How do people con- conceive it when we contextualize it in the beginning as a music video, and how do people perceive it as when we contextualize it as a narrative? And they were very two different things. So, I think. There has been no other project where we've received feedback to this level. And because obviously with content, many things finish and well, the shelf life is much shorter and the timeline sure. where you're working on it is much shorter. So having the time to just let people watch it and tell us what they think really helped us really helped that. It's if you watch version one, it's very different than what it is right now. Even version 12. Even version 12. <laughs> Maybe version 20 is also probably pretty different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that. I think about like this. I want to see the director's cut where like you just string together this four <laughs> hour version where all the versions are just stacked. You just watch it grow and, and change into what it's become. I love that too, because it's very collaborative. Again, this communal sense, this work, you, your collaborators together, but then you involve not only the people in the production, but the community to come and be like, help us make the best possible thing for all of us. And I love that. I think it speaks to this conversation we're having right now. Yeah, definitely. I, that reminded me of one story, which is uh, we had the client, Junsei, sit with us on a community screening. And we had brought our most, like, most critical filmmaker friends. Like, they have, like, really deep letterbox accounts. Like, they have Letterbox Pro. That's how, like, mm. filmmaker read they are. <laughs> um, and they just straight ripped into it. And I would just kind of look over, look at Junsei, like, how is he feeling like <laughs> like hearing like the then the characters are unlikable like the story doesn't make sense we're not feeling it like with and that happened to be the best feedback it was great to hear that but i was just watching you say i was like are we cool like you don't hate me <laughs> you know <laughs> like, well like you said you know you him. asked him yeah like you you had already asked him though at the yeah. outset what does success look game. like for you what happens if it flops and yeah. To, I'm sure he took a lot away from being able to see the critical feedback process of it and realize, I don't want to speak for him because I obviously don't know who he <laughs> is, but realizing that, you know, they take this work seriously. If they're willing to show a version, you know, that is being, you know, nitpicked a little bit in terms of what can you do better? What can we do here? And to then go back to the board and update, revise, create. But I think that I think that's I think that's really incredible because you don't necessarily hear about that kind of collaboration a lot when it comes yeah, to ironic. creative endeavors. I was like, ironically, mm. like I mentioned, trusting the process. He actually trusts the process. I think maybe more than we did in some ways. <laughs> where he's like, he's he probably has questions, but he's just like, no, we'll keep going. We'll keep going through it, and we're like 
how do we answer the the critiques? Like, what do we do about the the edit? Like, how do we? Yeah. Like, there was so many challenges where I was like, I don't even. I'm kind of stumped on how to address these things that they're mentioning. But you know, through time, we we figured it out, and you know, we we have an edit we really like. Yeah. yeah, and now you're here, and now we're approaching release in the spring. Yes. You've talked about it being, you know, the best, your favorite, or maybe not your favorite, but your, the best thing that you've worked on so far. What's the feeling as you approach, like, full pu- pu- full publicity for this, for No Clouds in My Summer? I was telling Jason when he walked in, I was like, I feel like, I feel like an NBA player, like, gearing up about to run out the alleyway. Like, this is how yeah. I felt right before our podcast. I was like, I feel like I'm, like, warming up. I'm getting some shots in. Like, I'm ready for the game. Like, I feel... You know, like, I even feel a little nervous talking about the project, but it feels really good. I feel very excited. Hell yeah. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm excited. I, it's been a while since I've done some sort of, like, film festival kind of run. And so I think coming into it, uh, I think a lot of the, maybe I've just grown as a person, matured, where I think before so much was weighing on the outcome of what this is. But I think maybe because, you know, like I said, fashion design is kind of my main creative pursuit right now. Yeah. The weight of it from what it was before, it doesn't feel so heavy. And I think I'm able to have a lot more fun. So just really trying to enjoy every moment instead of just being so stressed out with every single in and out, you know, yeah. acceptance, rejection, whatever, just being able to like, wherever we had to get accepted, we can go have a fun trip, you know, yes. enjoy the screening, whatever it is. So I think it's gonna be really fun this time. I love it. And I'm excited for y'all. When in the spring can we expect this to drop? And what does your like, touring festival schedule look like at the moment currently nothing confirmed but we just finished submitting recently it is slated to start coming out late february early march i think that'll okay. be around the time that fe- film festival acceptance come back too so spring is looking like where everything is going to happen the music is going to drop the film festivals are going to happen and uh hopefully we'll see where else we can get it placed I'm excited. I'm excited. I can't wait to watch it. Just having this conversation. Um, And I'm excited for the community to be able to watch it because I feel like it's a community project. Even though I had nothing to do with it, I feel like (laughs) I'm a part of it. I'm a part of it now. And it's exciting to see two young Asian American dudes doing something that I don't think that we've necessarily seen a lot of over the course of time in terms of this kind of project from our community. So it's really exciting. This might be thinking too far ahead. What's next Mm -hmm. now that this is getting ready to release? Is it like, we're just going to focus on this. Jason's going to do some fashion stuff on the side as well. (laughs) Do we have anything else in the pipe that's, or even in the ideation phase that you can share? Uh, I guess I, (laughs) something that this kind of sparked was, um, I actually shot a short film in 2019, Mm. which I never completed. Like I was kind of like 80% in the pandemic hits, I'm kind of like, it's a little existential with like creative, whatever. But um, after this project, we were talking about my short film and he was like, hey, let's just work together to finish this. So that's kind of on the docket of the next thing we're going to do. So it's so exciting because I get a this two year music video we've worked on project and then this like four year short film I've been working on. So I feel like this year for me is going to be wrapping up old projects and kind of like tying these loose ends. But I think there's a new energy to it. So I'm excited about that. Nice. Yeah, I think... uh... I think we both need some peer pressure every now and then to like get stuff done, you know, especially when this stuff has sure. no deadline. For sure. Yeah. Right. I feel you. Uh, what's, what's up with Popeye? Popeye? I I want to chase the bag this year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, hey, I feel you. I'm in the same boat. Yeah, I want to I want to get my finances straight. I want my parents to be proud of me and like to feel like they don't have to worry about like like me and my film production business. They, they're supportive, which is which I feel lucky, but I want them to feel, you know, hands behind the back, chilling. Like, yeah, that's something I want to do. I want to master Chinese. I want to move to Taiwan. <laughs> that's also okay. on the docket, be, living in Asia for a little bit. And I want to be a sign director by the end of 2024. So those, I'm just going to manifest those things. That's kind of like you were what just I would saying you were talking about your goals before we got on here. You were just talking <laughs> about those things. And I love them. I like that. I've been trying to like. I have a few things written down, um, but I love your ambition. I love what you want to do. And like, you have your eyes set on these key things. Like, this is what I want to make happen. And so I can't help but be rooting for you. I hope you all, you achieve all of those things. That's exciting. Um, 
I guess my one bonus question before we get out of here is, and you may have already answered it, is <clears throat> dream project to work on. What would be the dream project? But you're finishing up the short film now, Jason, that I don't know, is that the dream project? Or is there something else that you were like, if they called, I would answer. Uh, so in the background, I don't have any concrete stuff on it, but I think uh, one thing that I feel like merges kind of like my, my creative stories together is I have the film background. I went to film school, everything. That's what I've been pursuing forever. But then I started the fashion stuff and I feel like something that's not too far around the corner is some sort of fashion film. And that'd be beautiful if it was like with my brand as well. So, Hell yeah. I, you know, just digging into a lot of like the film fashion archives of just like different films of, of like huge luxury houses. The best ones are so creative. Like they have mm. the Hollywood directors directing it, but the opportunity for me to kind of use my skill set as a filmmaker and then apply that to something that I'm also designing, I think would be super exciting. So I don't know if it's even a dream. I feel like that's really possible. So yeah. hopefully sooner than later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. yeah. I love it. I want to help with that, by the way. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I that's you. my dream, to... too. Uh, yeah. What about you, Jeff? You got dream. a lot of stuff coming up in 2024, but any dream <laughs> projects that you're like, maybe I won't move to Taiwan because I got to work on this thing if they called me. Mm. Oh, that's a good question. Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, man. I Okay. I have, I'll say... My dream project would be, <laughs> would still take me out of the U.S. My dream project is to work in some capacity on an anime. When I was a kid, that's kind of how I got started. Mm, cool. um, I don't know what that means. I don't even know if they need like directors like that. If I could be tangential to the process, that would be a dream come true. Whether that's like working on, they have like anime openings that are kind of music video-ish, directing yeah. something like that. I think that would be a dream, though I'm not making any concrete steps towards that. <laughs> um <laughs> But yeah, I think my bigger dream that's not so specific is just to be an international director, to be able to like mm. be back and forth in Asia, to have like a command of like Chinese and English um, and bridging those two worlds. That would be sick. I love it. Well, you're taking that first step, getting conversational Chinese locked down. <laughs> Teacher, le- he's, he's in it. He's in it. He's in it for sure. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> treat him well, teach him those things. Don't make him do schoolwork. <laughs> Don't make him do schoolwork. We don't need to do that. We just need those conversations. Emotional connection. 100%. <laughs> Fellas, exactly. uh, I, I really appreciate you making the time to come on here. Share a little bit about not only your careers, but where you feel like we need to be going as a, a community uh, in the filmmaking industry. And then No Clouds in My Summer. Talking about this project got me really excited to know a little bit more about it here as we approach this release. Last but not least... How do we, how does this audience support y'all uh, in your individual careers and in your collaboration careers? How do we support mm. you going forward? Um, you can find, I'm pretty much always on my Instagram account, which is at popeyemedia.la. That's my production company. We're in the little warehouse situation right here. Music videos, commercials, that's where you can find us. Yeah, so uh, I think if you're local to LA, we will announce whatever film festivals we get into. So come out and support uh, uh, whatever whatever festivals we'll, we'll get and we'll announce those. My socials, uh, jason.huming.poon. Um, and the fashion brand Drop is... the fashion brand, yeah. Uh, Huming yeah. underscore underscore. So I'm sure you'll, you'll link it or whatever, but yeah. I do want to ask you if if there's still time. I, I Yeah. My last question would be is as... I Because I, I listened to your most recent podcast about you being an adoptee. Is there anything oh, that you, you would want to see in like cinema or TV about the adoptee experience? For me, I've only seen two documentaries, but is there something you're yearning to see? Oh, a hundred percent. Um, I don't know if we have enough time for me to answer this question, but <laughs> <laughs> no. So, I mean, that's a, I, I appreciate you asking. Like the biggest thing that I think we're missing as a community right now is a like good fictional narratives that tell in a, a nuanced story about an adoptee that is hopefully written directed and at least like pretty majority wise produced by adoptees and i think Mm. there are people who hold that identity work in the industry who can do that and again it comes back to this idea of accessibility visibility how do we create that infrastructure that can uplift and amplify those types of creators and those voices so we can tell those stories but we have 
a fair amount of documentary and like nonfiction um, narratives and stories and films that are out there right now, all of them worth watching, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. We have very few fictional representation and the ones that we do have have been problematic in different ways. Um, Generally, it's because somebody who's not adopted is telling that story. And so I guess at the end of the day, whether it's not, if, even if it's not a project specifically, it's really putting adoptees in the position to be able to tell those stories, whether it's in the director's chair, whether it's on screen talent, whether it's writing those stories in a collaborative writer's room, whatever that looks like, that's what I would like to see just getting into the door to be able to tell that story. So I appreciate you asking. Mm. Do, you have, do you have recommendations actually for stuff to watch? Um, so the documentary Geographies of Kinship is really really good um i actually just had a conversation today with someone who's written an ethnography that mentions the movie blue bayou um which was done by justin chan i think two years ago very divisive and controversial within the adoptee (laughs) community however had the opportunity like i liked the movie overall and i thought it did he did do a good job of representation for this particular experience is about a an adoptee who was adopted from korea who doesn't have citizenship um Mm -hmm. which is a very real issue that we're dealing with thought the movie was great unfortunately he kind of appropriated a specific person's story um and that was where a lot of the controversy came from so you know take that with what you will but Overall, I think if we could have more stories like that one in particular, it would be really good. Geographies of Kinship is just a great look at different adoptive voices who are talking about just kind of the overall history of an international adoption out of Korea, specifically. Um, those two, 100%. Uh, I can send you a list of some more, some more docs for sure. Yes. But like Joyride that just came out, big blockbuster hit adoptee character central lead character played by ashley park not written or done or like any adoptee like uh peep, any adoptees in the in, in the production of the film and so that's one of the problems that we keep running into and it's interesting because it's like well it's asian american representation which is great but it's like at what point does it stop like what are we willing to maybe not compromise on, but what are we willing to hold ourselves to when it comes to the stories that we tell, mm. you know? So I think that's the interesting thing. That's the part of the the missing piece of this conversation around our specific community that we're trying to address. It's like, who gets to tell our stories and how do we tell them? Man. Yeah. These are very interesting. These are interesting, great things that you want actually. Yeah. Yeah, well, I appreciate you asking. Uh, I will say that not many people ask me a question at the end, so it kind of caught me off guard, even though this is a <laughs> subject I love to talk about. But no, I appreciate you asking because I think it, it ties into this whole idea, again, of infrastructure, accessibility, visibility, particularly from our Asian American standpoint, and then the sub, uh, met sub, but the different identities that exist within that larger diaspora. And, mm-hmm. you know, like there are plenty of stories that are waiting to be told. And it's like, how do we get the people who actually hold those identities into the spaces that we can then tell those stories appropriately and accurately? So Mm. if you all figure it out, let me know and we can make it happen. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, fellas, I appreciate you joining me today. Thank you for taking the time for everybody out there. You know, you're going to find links to Popeye, to Huming. Is I, did I pronounce that right? That's You're going right, to find right. all of those links in the show notes down here, and you'll be able to connect with Jason and Jeff in whatever way that you wish. For us, new episodes of the show drop every Tuesday, wherever you get your podcasts, as well as on YouTube. If you want to support the show, please leave us a rating or review wherever you get those podcasts. And you can follow us on Instagram at Conversation Pod Piece. Make sure you also subscribe to the newsletter, Conversation Piece, the newsletter, which comes out every Monday. And paid subscribers get exclusive access to our companion show, Conversation Notes, which comes out every Wednesday. So I cannot wait to share all of this with you. Can't wait for y'all to hear this conversation, to see no clouds in my summer, to see all of the new work that's going to be coming out. But until then, I'm the titular Patrick, and this has been Conversation Peace. I'll see y'all soon.